Welcome to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with the president of the Christian Research Institute, Hank Hanegraaff. Our mission is to equip you with answers to share the hope that you have within you because life and truth matter. Why? Because being armed with truth will equip you to counter the corrosive worldviews at work in our world today. While experiencing the authentic Christian life will make you a winsome witness of the purpose of life which is to experience union with God and Christ, both for today and for all eternity. If you'd like to ask Hank a question, please call in now at 888-ASK-HANK. That's 888-275-4265. For more information about CRI and the Bible Answer Man broadcast, go to our website at equip.org. And now, here's Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. As always, a privilege to be in studio. We're live. We're taking your questions in just a little while. The number to dial, 888 ask Hank, as just mentioned. Uh, y- you can relate that to 888 275 4265 numerically. The information we talk about, the resources that are designated, you can find on the web at equip.org or you can write me at box 85. 85- 100 Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Do want to say something about the release of my book, which took place two days ago on Tuesday, uh, November 12th, the official release of my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, The Unexpected Beauty of an Authentic Christian Life. It was simultaneously released as both a book and audio pages and either one available for your support of the ministry of the Christian Research Institute. So the best place to get the book is through the ministry at equip.org. I've often said that if we relegate the Christian experience to a head full of knowledge, to mental assent to logical truth propositions, we are in danger of devolving into a transactional rather than a transformational relationship with the lover of our souls. A transaction that, well, that offers heaven and the avoidance of hell, but is strangely devoid of the transformational intimacy that Christ offers his apprentices right here, right now. Not a mere head full of knowledge, but active participation in the kingdom of God. Entrance into the divine life of the Holy Trinity. Union with the Triadic One. I love the story told by Dallas Willard in The Divine Conspiracy about growing up in an area of Missouri that was devoid of electricity. And during his senior year in high school, when the transformational power of electricity became available, residents had a choice. They had a choice to believe and rely on electricity or to continue living as they lived before. Incredibly, some refused to turn and enter into as it were, the kingdom of electricity. They just didn't want to change. They refused to believe in the reality of electricity. And as I've said, I have found myself in a similar situation. I believe truth mattered. But the notion that I could participate in the divine nature was essentially lost on me. You might say electricity had come, but I continued to muddle along apart from its transformational reality. In a tragic twist, says Dallas Willard, the souls of human beings are left to shrivel and die on the plains of life because they are not introduced into the environment for which they were made, the living kingdom of eternal life. And yet... By the grace of God, my shriveled condition was dramatically transformed as a result of hearing the three-word phrase, life matters more. And that's why the book is titled, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. Of course, we could well say that there can be no life without truth, as well as no truth without life. 
The life that matters more is a realm largely inaccessible to our human apprehensions of truth. And as such, it involves a mysterium that is to be experienced rather than explained. So while the divine incomprehensibility of the life that matters more is not a prohibition upon knowledge, it is the transcending of knowledge, the transcending of all philosophical speculation. This has been well said, Christian theology is always in the last resort of means. It's a unity of knowledge subserving an end which transcends all knowledge, and that ultimate end is what I write about in the book when I talk about union with God or deification. Again, the book available, check it out on the web at equip.org. Let's go to the phone lines and talk first to Aaron in Washington, D.C., Aaron is listening on Sirius XM 131. Hi, Aaron. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Hey, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I, have, I have a question in regards to a, a Christian and ambition. Um, tying back to Proverbs 16.9, a man determines his path, but the Lord determines his steps. So really, just broadly, I, I guess, what is, what is the biblical view of ambition? Well, I, you know, I think that we have to apply ourselves and be ambitious in that sense, which is to say that we are accountable, as the Lord made very plain, for the talents that he has given us. Uh, we are in deep trouble if we take those talents and bury them, as opposed to multiplying those talents. And that takes a certain about, uh, amount of ambition, but the ambition has to be godly ambition. It's very much like what I say when I talk about capitalism. Capitalism in its secularized form, I think, is a system that has all kinds of pitfalls. However, if you think about capitalism from a Christian perspective or Christian capitalism, then you're rightly perceiving responsibility associated with wealth. And I think the same thing is true with ambition. Uh, to be ambitious in a, in a godless sense is far different than being ambitious for the kingdom, not for self-aggrandizement or fame, but rather to extend his kingdom, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate your time. Thank you. you. You got it. Thank you so much for your call. Do nothing, says uh, Philippians, by the way. Uh, Paul is writing in the second chapter, and, and, and he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Uh, consider others better than yourselves. Back to the phone lines. We'll talk next to Mark in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, K-A-R-I. Hi, Mark. Yeah, hi, sir. I wanted to ask you, sir, like, uh, I have the same position as you as far as the partial preterist uh, view is, and also, uh, like, for example, Steve Gregg, he has that view as well, but he said for many years he had the other more dispensational view uh, before he came to that uh, more correct view. Uh, was that the case with you also, or did you always, from the beginning of your Christian experience, uh, have the teaching concerning the partial preterist as opposed to dispensational? Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting question, Mark. For most of my ministry, I didn't really have a position because I didn't feel qualified to communicate a position. And so if people listen to me on the Bible Answer Man broadcast for 15 years or so, and they would ask a question, and I would give an answer on eschatology, I would say, look, I don't think I'm qualified to answer this question, but here are the various positions that are held. In the meantime, I was ferociously pursuing the study of eschatology uh, by reading the scriptures and studying uh, uh, passages that have to do with eschatology, although all of the Bible is eschatological in some sense. It's all an unfolding. At any rate, I ended up writing uh, a book called The Apocalypse Code, find out what the Bible really says about the end times and why it matters today. In that book, I demonstrate that while I have sympathy for the partial preterist position, I'm not officially a partial preterist. I... Uh, I, I actually talk about a system of exegetical eschatology, which is what I adhere to. I'm definitely not a dispensationalist. I think dispensationalism 
causes someone to read the Bible with a particular lens or filter. And that is, you look at the Bible and you believe that the Bible is the story of two distinct people with two distinct plans necessitating two distinct phases of the second coming, a secret coming followed seven years later by a second coming. I think that, as I've written about in the Apocalypse Code, that is an imposition on the text of Scripture. That is not exegetical, it is eisegetical. In other words, it's reading a paradigm into the Scripture or imposing a paradigm on the Scripture as opposed to reading the Bible for all it's worth. A uh, complete elucidation of what I just said you'll find in my book, as mentioned, The Apocalypse Code, find out what the Bible really says about the end times and why it matters today. That book available uh, through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Check it out on the web at equip.org. The number to dial, triple eight, ask Hank, and we'll be right back. Rob Mall wrote The Art of Dying to recover the deeply Christian practice of dying well. For centuries, Christians have prepared for the good death with spiritual disciplines that direct the actions of both the living and the dying. The Art of Dying is a gentle companion for all who face death, whether one's own or that of a loved one. As Christians, we know that death is not the end. Thus, preparing to die helps us to truly live. To receive your copy of The Art of Dying, Living fully into the life to come, call 888-7000-CRI and support the life-changing work of the Christian Research Institute. That's 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. We'll be back in just a moment with more from Hank Hanegraaff. Hank Hanegraaff has dedicated his life to defending truth because truth matters. However, his life and ministry were radically transformed by another three-word phrase, life matters more. Truth matters because Christianity is rooted in history and evidence. Life matters more because it is the experience of union with God. The goal of Christian life is union with God. All attempts to understand Christianity from a solely rational perspective put us in danger of devolving into a transactional rather than transformational relationship with God. Truth Matters, Life Matters More will equip you to move beyond intellectually knowing about God to experientially knowing Him in Christ. To receive your copy of Truth Matters, Life Matters More, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us online at equip.org. Unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will die. But most of us live as if death does not exist. Simply put, we don't know how to die well. Rob Mall wrote The Art of Dying to recover the deeply Christian practice of dying well. For centuries, Christians have prepared for the good death with spiritual disciplines that direct the actions of both the living and the dying. The Art of Dying is a gentle companion for all who face death whether one's own or that of a loved one. As Christians, we know that death is not the end. Thus, preparing to die helps us to truly live. To receive your copy of The Art of Dying, Living Fully into the Life to Come, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org. The Christian Research Journal is CRI's award-winning magazine, combining eye-catching design with well-researched articles to equip believers in doctrine, defense, and discernment. The Christian Research Journal's primary commitment is to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In keeping with this commitment, the journal's mission is both evangelistic and pastoral, furthering the proclamation and defense of the historic gospel of Jesus Christ and helping his followers distinguish between essential Christian doctrine and doctrine that is peripheral, aberrant, or heretical. In an age of subjectivism and moral relativism, may Christians ground their faith and values in the objective, reliable testimony of Holy Scripture. 
Start your subscription to the Christian Research Journal today. Call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. That's equip.org. Once again, here is Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. I, um, I don't often like to read letters on the air, but every now and then you have a letter that is so well written, so poignant and so moving that uh, I want to read it on air. And I was handed this letter as I walked into the studio today. It says, good day, Brother Hank. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia from Charlotte, North Carolina in the summer of 1989. My wife and I were married in November of that year and I rededicated my life to Christ. At that time, I began to listen to your teaching ministry on the radio. As I drove home from work, I heard you proclaim the gospel. So CRI reinforced to me the reading of my Bible. I learned to counterfeit his best exposed by being able to recognize the genuine, I subscribed to the Christian Research Journal, and that contributed greatly to my growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Employed as an electrical engineer, I found many of my coworkers on my new job were from India and Germany and from Russia and from China. The unbelieving world that they had grown up in was also imported to our office through the ministry outreaches of the Christian Research Institute and by the Holy Spirit, I was soon challenged to learn more about witnessing and shown how to be aware of false teaching being handed out by the cults and foreign religions. I continue to pray for your recovery. I know that God created us and so I believe God can heal us. Thank you for your encouraging and helping me and my family. We are so glad that you are our brother in Christ. With love, Billy and Susan, postscript uh, Colossians 1, 9 through 14. A wonderful letter. It reminds me of a couple of things. The first thing it reminds me of is the significance of the Christian Research Journal. We have been laboring hard to make certain that you have a double issue of the journal out this December so you can consume its delicious contents between Christmas and New Year's, if not before that. If you've not subscribed to the journal, you can do so in a safe, secure fashion on the web at equip.org. The letter also reminds me to encourage many of you to support the ministry of the Christian Research Institute, not only prayerfully, but also in a very tangible way financially. We often say, you're not giving to us, but through us. If you've been listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast for any period of time, you know I don't spend a lot of time asking people to support the ministry, and perhaps that's not a good thing. I don't know. I, uh, I do know that... Uh, it, it's necessary for me to let you know that there is a need financially now, and if you have some of the Lord's resources and can supply that need, it would be deeply appreciated, used for God's glory and for the extension of His kingdom. Uh, one of the resources you'll find on the web available for those who support this month is a very masterful work called The Art of Dying, Living Fully, into the life to come. I mentioned on a previous edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast that this book is written by Rob Mole, who died not all that long uh, after writing the book. In fact, he died July 19th of this year. Uh, and uh, that was one day after my birthday. And uh, so he's absent from the body, present with the Lord. And uh, we're surrounded by people like uh, Rob. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That book, again, is very important because it not only talks about the art of dying, which is something that is oftentimes driven into the closet. We trivialize it with clever cliches. We paper it over. We're not aware of dying like people were in the past. They were confronted with death. Now it's sort of hidden from us. And 
I, I, I think oftentimes as a result of that, we don't know the art of dying. So again, an important book uh, available for those who support the ministry all this month. You can do so via the mailbox, 8500 Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271, or on the web at equip.org. Thank you for your support. Let's go to the phone lines, talk to Joel in uh, North Dakota, listening on Sirius XM 131. Hi, Joel. Hey, Hank. Thank you. I'm so thankful for your recovery. Um, I was reading in my Bible reading about Ecclesiastes 10 too, uh -huh. and I wondered if that would apply to today's politics. Yeah, so Ecclesiastes 10 too is the passage that talks about the heart of the wise inclining to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Now, I wouldn't uh, take this in a wooden literalistic sense and say inclining it to the left means that you're voting for leftist pol politics. I mean, that's not the intent. But I, I do think the sense of it is communicating that if you are wise, then you're going to follow that which is right and true and good and honorable and pure and just. And unfortunately, what we've seen in our political system is narratives that have nothing whatsoever to do with truth, but rather narratives that are forwarding particularly political, particular political agendas. And I think that is uh, tragic. Uh, I think we can say uh, with a certainty that truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless you love the truth, you cannot know it. I am absolutely mystified by how it is possible for so many people to have such a, a, a dim view of truth. It's not about what truth is, what fact is compared to falsehood, but rather it is my truth, what I believe to be true. Uh, which oftentimes doesn't have its roots in reality at all. So I think that the text in principle does apply uh, or can be applied to the abdication of truth in our political system. Thank you so much. And I do, I believe it's derangement is what we see. It's just well, I, perverse I, almost. Yeah, it well, it is perverse, absolutely. And thank you so much for your call, Joel. You know, I mentioned on the broadcast the other day the biblical support for making the sign of the cross. I, I, I sort of gave a very truncated answer. But, but but let me say in a little more detail in answer to the questions that have arisen since that as I've often quoted uh, uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. So I believe in holy tradition. I don't believe in traditionalism. While we have the right to shun traditionalism, we spurn holy tradition at our own peril. So rather than dance on the ashes of the saints, we would do well to grow in the traditions that they treasured. As the honored... St. John Chrysostom uh, astutely asserted the apostles did not deliver all things by epistle, but many things also unwritten, and in like manner, both the one and the other are worthy of credit. All of this to say that while there's no specific scriptural prescription for making the sign of the cross, which I've been asked about so many times. There is ample evidence that this was the ubiquitous practice of Christians across the history of the church. Uh, you might recall the early church father Tertullian, who spoke of making the sign of the cross in all of our travels and movements, or St. Athanasius the Great, who memorably exuded that by the sign of the cross, all magic is stayed, all sorcery confounded, all idols are abandoned and deserted, and all senseless pleasure ceases, or Cyril, 
uh, who was the patriarch of Jerusalem, who, who told new Christians to integrate the sign of the cross into the fabric of daily living. Or I might even add the father of the Protestant Reformation, Luther, who urged devotees to begin morning and evening prayers by making the sign of the cross. Uh, it's not until after the schism that ruptured the western half of the church that Christians began denigrating the sign of the cross. Loosed from the restraining fetters of apostolic tradition, from the creeds, from the councils, everything seems up for grabs. Zwingli, the Swiss reformer, went so far as to reimagine both the Eucharist and baptism, and from then to now, much has been lost. We continue to position crosses atop our churches and cathedrals, but largely fail to make the sign of the cross over bodily temples in which the Holy Re uh, Spirit resides. I'm going to do a video on that in the very near future, flesh that out a little bit more, but I hope that gives you a little food for thought as we end today's edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Again, my thanks to all of you who stand shoulder to shoulder with me in the battle for life and truth. It is a battle. Truth is on the altar. It's being sacrificed. So standing for truth makes a big difference. But truth also leads to life. Get my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. Thanks for tuning in to the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Our website, equip.org, has an abundance of resources to sharpen your discernment skills and help you grow in life and truth. We provide books, videos, and informative articles. You can also listen to the broadcast live, download archived programs, get answers to pressing Bible questions, follow our blog, or connect with us via social media. All this and more at equip.org. Again, the address is equip.org. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is supported solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. Unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will die. But most of us live as if death does not exist. Simply put, we don't know how to die well. Rob Mall wrote, The Art of Dying, to recover the deeply Christian practice of dying well. For centuries, Christians have prepared for the good death with spiritual disciplines that direct the actions of both the living and the dying. The Art of Dying is a gentle companion for all who face death, whether one's own or that of a loved one. As Christians, we know that death is not the end. Thus, preparing to die helps us to truly live. To receive your copy of The Art of Dying, Living Fully into the Life to Come, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org.